Hello and uh, welcome back. So what we discussed yesterday was that we could start off with a structure such as the rational numbers with order or maybe the integers with order or maybe the natural numbers with equality only. I would call such a structure the atoms. Ah, bigger font. And oh, bigger font or is this, is this okay? I'll try with this because this is my usual font. This is my system font size, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, so we started with that and then we could build sets like, for example, for these atoms, it would be like you take the all, all intervals So you could build sets like this. So this is supposed to be all open intervals that go from some y up to 5 and where y is at least 2. So this would be called a set builder expression. And if you weren't, if you don't remember, here, you, could, you were allowed to write any first order constraint. You would be allowed to use the vocabulary of your structure. You would also be allowed to use constants. And for some structures, such as this one or this one, actually quantification is not necessary because every formula is equivalent to a quantifier free one, but that may or may not be true. Okay. Now let's consider an example. Ah, maybe before I give you the example, then if we had such sets, then they would be finitely representable. Well, this is, I mean, here's the representation. And you could manipulate them. So, for example, you could ask this and uh, you could compute the answer to that. So maybe let me, I'm not sure I want to prove this, this is a little bit boring, but at least I'll state it as a theorem. For every choice of atoms, and there's no assumptions here, it doesn't have to be decidable in any way, Okay, given x and y by set builder expressions, so you're given such a set builder expression, one can compute in polynomial time a first order formula phi, depending on these set builder expressions, such that there's no free variables, so it's either true or false, such that x equals y if and only if the formula Okay, so maybe I give you like one example of this result. It's a proof by example. Okay, so say you have this set, so this is going to be x. Okay, it's going to be a trivial example of this result. Uh, it's going to be all x's 
such that x, y, uh, x is an atom, such that uh, and here you have some constraint, I don't know. Some constraint phi 1. And then you have another set, y, which is written the same way, but there's a different constraint. So this is the constraint for x, and this is the constraint for y. So if you want to know that they're, if they're true equal, the formula just has to say that for every x which satisfies this, there exists an x which satisfies this, and for every uh, little x that satisfies this, there exists a little x that satisfies that. Yeah? So essentially the set of x's which satisfy them are equal, but I write it like this. For every x uh, well, it's the same x, yes? Every x that satisfies this also satisfies this, and this also satisfies this. But then you might have some more complicated things. So, for example, you could have this. And here, maybe like this. And then what you have to say is that for every little x, little y, such that this is true, either x, y satisfies the other formula or y, x satisfies the other formula. And then you go on like this. <laughs> okay? it's, a, it's just pure symbol pushing. There's really nothing going on. It's, you, can think of the, you can think of the nesting as a sort of quantification and you just push it around. It's a, it's a straightforward syntactic representation and it's even polynomial. It, may, it's a, it requires a little thought of uh, why it's actually polynomial, but this is not very hard. I don't want to bore you with this. Maybe there's one question that is natural at this stage is, if I have no assumptions on A, what does it even mean to compute? Uh, like, for example, if A is the real numbers. Uh, so how do you even input an set builder expression? Because two could be a real number, yeah? And then you just have to be a little bit careful about your machine models. So like, you can imagine that the little uh, constants, they're like, you can pick up, uh, you, can, you have a, a, a set builder expression and uses some constants and you can just pick up a constant and move it somewhere else. And you just have to be careful about the machine model. But uh, if you thought about it for a minute, you would figure out the appropriate machine model that makes this meaningful. So it's not a big deal. Okay? And similar things are true for member, equal, and all sorts of other basic straightforward things you might want to do for sets. Okay? So in this sense, set builder expressions are natural. Well, they, they behave like finite sets. You can, you can do all sorts of things with them, like, you know, check if one belongs to the other, take a union of two of them, and so on. Compute their products, etc. But there are things... Uh, that you can do for finite sets, which are not obvious for, uh, uh, for set builder expressions. And I mentioned one yesterday, which was, suppose you have a graph, which is given by a set builder expression. So the vertices are given by a set builder expression, and the edges are given by a set builder expression. And you want to know if it's connected. Then, if you remember, you could come up with an example. And actually, already this structure was enough for it because we only wanted to have the notion of successor, uh, such that it would be an undecidable problem, given a graph, is it connected or not? Okay? And I want to focus at the, today a little bit more on this connectivity problem. So in the end, it's going to be about, I'm, we're going to dis discuss the decision problem, is a graph connected? But let's start with an, some kind of example. Uh, let's consider this one example. The atoms are natural numbers with equality and consider the following graph. It's going to be, I, let's say, undirected. It's not important. Vertices 
are triples. And there is an edge So you can go from A, B, C to A prime, B prime, C prime. And it's going to be undirected because you could, if you can go one way, you can go the other. If you look at the six things that participate, and the idea is that uh, everything that appears there appears an odd number of times. Okay? So. Let's say if uh, so, you have an edge from one, two, three, two, four, five, six, because well, everything appears an odd number of times. You also have an edge from one, two, three, two, one, one, six, because one appears an odd number of times, but you don't have an edge from 1 to 3 to, uh, to uh, 1, 4, 5. Because 1 appears an even number of times. Don't try to understand this graph. It's not important. It's just some kind of random example. But let me make the following statement. This graph has diameter Three, which means not only is it connected, but you can go from every vertex to every other vertex by using at most three edges. I'm not sure three is the right number, but it's something like that. So uh, let's say I want to go, say, from one to three to somewhere. <laughs> okay? Then the first step I do is I go to some completely fresh vertex. And let's say maybe, for example, I want to go to 1, 1, 2. This I couldn't do straight away because 2 appears an even number of times. So I go to some completely fresh vertex. It's still not OK, yeah, because, uh, uh, because 1 appears twice. But then I can go, say, 1, 5, 6. Did I do it right? Uh, yeah, seven. It has to be fresh. Wanted to, I wanted it to be fresh. Seven, eight. It's probably not optimal. But so here's an example of a path of length three. And uh, yeah, I tried like two examples and I could always do it with a path of length three. So that's why I write diameter three. What is definitely is that it has finite diameter because it's a theorem, okay? But, so this particular graph has diameter 3, and there's a theorem which says, it's a special case of this, which says, for every graph defined by a set builder expression over this, if it's connected, then it has finite diameter. So if we're talking, for example, about undirected graphs, if you can go from somewhere, then you can go from the, the, there's, a, there's a, on a fixed, for every connected component, there's a finite bound such that every two vertices from that connected component uh, can be reached in that bound number of steps. So you cannot have, inside a given component, you cannot have longer and longer paths well, that are necessary, longer and longer shortest paths. So we will this will follow from other results. And this will be true not only for these atoms, but for several other atoms, the oligomorphic ones that I mentioned in the last lecture. But let's to, like, to take a corollary of this theorem before we prove it. Corollary. Here's a straightforward algorithm for graph connectivity. 
We're given a graph. And we just do a breadth first search. So we choose some random vertex. There are several ways of doing it, but I think this many. And now you compute the reachable vertices. So you start with the vertex itself. And then you take the vertices which are reachable in one step. Okay, so Rn is, uh, is the vertices reachable in at most 10 steps. And then you do this until nothing is added. And then you return is Rn equal to z. Which is the stupidest algorithm for graph connectivity that you could do. Okay? But it works. Why? Because you start in some random element, it has a connected component. Okay? Now, I should, to be honest, I should explain that it's, uh, the connected component, uh, you can apply this theorem to the connected component, but it's true, it's not so hard to justify. Another way you could do it, you could have a, a, a slightly stronger statement of this theorem, namely every connected component has finite diameter. This is also true. Because, uh, so, uh, and one, one other thing which is true is that every connected component is, can be defined by a set builder expression. Uh, so it has finite diameter, therefore necessarily you will stabilize. Because at some point, any, any, the n is going to stabilize at the diameter number of steps. You don't even need to know that it can be computed, you just wait for it to happen, it's bound to happen at some point, that, that's all you need. Okay. So this very natural fixed point algorithm is, going, is, is a proof of correctness that it works. So for these atoms, graph reachability is decidable by this algorithm. I should have justified that all of these things can be done. Because, so, first of all, that I, given a set builder expression, I can extract an element from it, but this is kind of easy to see. Uh, you just look at the set builder expression. It could be a union, so you take one of the elements, then you just randomly substitute something for y, which satisfies the guard, and then you just take out the set builder expression, which does that. Uh, well, this is easy because if you have a set builder expression for v, then you just surround it with one layer of set brackets, you get the set expression for this. Uh, Testing equality is this theorem because it reduces to writing first order formulas and first order formulas over this very stupid structure are decidable. I mean, if you have a first order formula with equality only, then it's, it's quite easy to decide. Uh, there's nothing really left to do. And finally, I should explain how you can, given set builder expressions for R and Rn and E, you can compute this, but this is it's some symbol pushing. It's not really hard to do. Okay. So essentially the local computation steps can be done by this result and its friends. And then the, the, the important part that this non-local thing, termination, it's a follow from this. So this is the type of things that we get. But why is this white theorem true? And this I will explain now, well in this lecture, and the idea is to use uh, the semantic approach in terms of orbits. So let me maybe uh, do that. Uh, so let's draw the following picture. The reason why the white theorem is true is because there is an alternative non-syntactic way of looking at these sets. It's uh, using orbits. So let's, let me put it like this. So you have all sets that, uh, let's fix, fix some atoms. 
So some relational structure like these. Some of the, the, the oligomorphic ones will be good. The, the, the other ones will not. I will remind you that oligomorphic is at a given point, point. And you can consider all sets It's, it's deliberately, I don't have, have a short name for this because this concept is not going to be used. So I just keep a long name for it. So what does this mean? It, if you want to formally define it, it's, you define it by ordinal numbers. So sets of rank zero is there's just one set of rank zero, the empty set. And a set of rank n greater than zero is any set where all elements are atoms or sets of rank. So if you think of a set as a tree, then it's just a you add, you add a root and have smaller rank things, okay? And this n is an ordinal number. I mean, this has not much to do with atoms. I mean, you could just ask, in general, what's a set? So that's, here's the definition of what a set is in general. It's an empty set and anything that contains simpler sets in a well-founded way, okay? So we have, and clearly, Things like this define sets that use atoms, yes? Because there's a set bracket and so on. What is the rank of this set? Rank in this, the terms here? What rank does this set have? Two. Two. It's something like the nesting of brackets. I don't know, plus one or minus one. I don't know. But I think it's two, okay? So with set builder expressions, you're going to define sets of finite rank. But in principle, there exist sets of infinite rank. So now some of these are set builder expressions. Not all of them, because for example, we just observed that they have finite rank. Okay? So which ones? So this, there's a nice thing that you can define this in a way which doesn't use syntax. Namely, it is exactly the set we have the following two properties. Number one, and I will explain this in a moment, finite support and number two, orbit finite, finitely many orbits. So I will explain what does it mean for a set to have finite support in a moment, and I will explain what it means to have finitely many orbits. I guess the second one is kind of intuitive. It has finitely many elements up to some kind of automorphism. We discussed this already before, implicitly, but... And I want... Uh, so it turns out that this is exactly this, and that what I mean is hereditarily... Because a set can have finite support. I'll explain what this means in a moment. But its elements might not have finite support. So hereditarily means that the set has finite support, its elements have finite support, and so on. Until the end. Likewise for orbit finite. So this is a theorem we're going to prove today. And using this theorem, it will be kind of easy to show the white theorem up above because it will be relatively easy to show that if I have a graph where both the vertices and the edges are orbit finite, then the diameter must be finite. This will be easy to show, okay? And it is the semantic view which is going to be useful. So let me start by explaining what finite support means. Uh, by the way, you could imagine an intermediate step, which are sets which have finite support, but not necessarily orbit finite. Well, you could also imagine the other, but the other doesn't really make sense. And this is an, a, a meaningful notion, and this is the frankel mostowski sets that I mentioned yesterday during the exercise session. But we care about this one. 
Okay. Let me explain what does it mean to be to have finite support. So let me prove this, put this other here. The definition would be follow from the whatever the theorem says. So let x be defined by a set builder expression which uses atoms A1, An. So these are the atoms that literally appear in the set builder expression. In this case, 5 and 2. Okay? Then, if I take pi for every pi, it's an atom automorphism. So remember, it's a function from atoms to atoms, which is compa compatible with the structure, so it preserves the relations and the functions and so on. If it does not move the parameters, then it does not move the set. Okay? We, we argued this during the exercise session. I'll do it one more time on an, just proof by example. And the example will also sort of explain what does this, what does this even mean. Because in principle, this function pi is defined on the atoms only, but uh, you can extend it to sets and sets of sets and sets of sets in the natural way. So this is, what, this, this is actually the extension of the automorphism to objects that are built using atoms. So let's just do that proof by example. For this set. Okay? This set, suppose you take some atom automorphism pi. So this set is defined, x is defined by a set builder expression that uses 2 and 5. So let me take an atom automorphism pi which fixes 2 and 5. Okay? So let's see, let's just apply this, for example, to an interval. If I apply this to the interval, say, from 3 to 5, this is the open interval. Open interval in the rational numbers, which By the way, I, I discovered recently that the French, they use a different notation for intervals, which is what? Square brackets with inverted. So I think this one would be... Is it a semicolon? So you write the brackets in this way or the other, depending on whether it's closed or open. And you can imagine the discovery was due to some confusion. <laughs> okay? And suppose I map this open interval by pi. What will I get? What, what does it even mean to apply an automorphism to, to an interval? Just apply it to every point in the interval. Well, first of all, you also get an interval because pi is by an automorphism, so by definition it preserves the order. So if there's two things in between, then this will be also true before and after, yes? And it's kind of easy to see that it's just, you have to do it to the end point. And it's anything between those end points. And this, by our assumption, is actually 5. Okay? So for example, this atom automorphism is going to map any interval that open interval that 
start with phi is going to map it to an open interval that's, sorry, any open interval that ends with phi is going to end with phi as well. And uh, for the same reason, if the open interval end, starts with something that's after 2, then you apply pi to it, it's also going to start with something that starts after 2. Okay? Which part? So, is this example good enough? Just, uh, there's really nothing going on. Uh, I just wanted to explain that how, wh wh what it means to apply this pi. In principle, it works on the atoms, but you can lift it to sets, but it preserves all structures. So. And if you assume that it preserves the constants that appear in the expression, then it completely does nothing to the expression. Okay? So, that's the definition that this, this observation And uh, the conclusion is the definition of what we want. So this thing here, we just say that A supports X. Just, this is by definition. Okay? Uh, so we have just, and what does it mean that X has finite support? It means that there is some finite tuple of atoms which supports it. So we have just proved that you define anything by a set builder expression, a set builder expression necessarily can use finitely many atoms, and it's going to be supported by those atoms. And therefore, every set builder expression is going to have finite support. But it's also going to have finite support hereditarily because the elements of a set builder expression are sort of like sub expressions. So they're also going to have finite support. Mm -hmm. So we have just proved that. Before I continue, I'd like to say a few more words about supports because this is a relatively abstract notion that it's going to play quite a strong role in the rest of the lecture. And yeah, I'd like to illustrate it. So here I have illustrated it with a special case. And now I'll go the opposite way. I'll try to explain it by generalizing it. I hope that these two approaches will help you to understand. So the notion of support is a very general notion. And I'll try to justify it here. It's as follows. To talk about supports, you only need a set with a group action. Okay? So suppose you have a set X. And a group G, group acting on the set X. And if you remember, that means that you can apply an element, uh, you can view every uh, element of the group as a transformation on the set X, such that uh, it is comp if you either take uh, subject to this axiom, So that's, whenever you have this, it's meaningful to talk about support. So the, defin the abstract definition is this, x in x supports y in x if pi of x equals x implies pi y equals y for all pi in the group chain. Just That's a gener generic notion. And if you remember, in the exercise session, we showed that this is equivalent to saying, and maybe this, this other statement is more intuitive, that it means the same thing as pi of x equals sigma of x implies pi of y equals sigma of y, again for all pi sigma. So the lower thing it sort of means if you want to know the value of pi on y, 
you only care, it's only important what pi does to x, and that uniquely tells you what pi does to y as well. Okay? So that's what support means. And what we have on the upper board, it just says that, well, what is the set? X. I'm waiting. What is the set X? Oh, it's a bit confusing because... <laughs> uh, yeah. Too bad. This is anything that can be built using atoms. The group is the automorphism of the atoms themselves, and there's a natural notion action of automorphism of the actions on everything that's com uh, automorphism of the atoms themselves. You can lift up functions on the atoms to a, a function on the at sets of sets of sets and so on. So X, let me call it prime because it's, uh, I don't know, space. Ah, this is also confusing. Space. So the above notion is recovered by taking big S to be everything that's built out of atoms, the group to be the automorphism on the atoms themselves, which can be naturally extended to act on everything that's built on the atoms. Okay? And then uh, here we talk, uh, in particular, a tuple of atoms is built out of atoms, and therefore this is the support notion that we use. Okay? But it's, uh, it's, it's kind, of a kind of a nice notion, so you can maybe illustrated in other examples. For example, you can take, say, S is drawings in the plane, and G is isomorphisms. So drawings means just subsets, yes? And then, for example, if you take a triangle, then it's supported by one of its sides. Yeah? I, I guess. Because if an isomorphism fixes this, 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 this little line, this one side, then it actually cannot do... Uh, it's actually uh, it's an identity, I hope. Is that true? If an isomorphism... Uh, ah, isomorphism. This is not very helpful. Uh, Isometries. I need to remember my geometry, but I think if you fix two, isometry fixes two points, then it uh, doesn't, uh, uh, it, 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 it has to, it fixes everything, yeah? Uh, but if you take just a single point, then it does not support. because you can rotate around that point and not fix the triangle, okay? So this is a, it's a, it's a purely abstract notion. You look like you disagree with my geometric theorems. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's wrong, but I hope it's right, but it's meant to illustrate the general notion, okay? So what we have just, well, proved by example, but it's true and it's not hard to show, is that if you define anything by a set builder expression, then it is going to be supported by the atoms that appear in it. That's kind of easy. The second issue is much more sophisticated, and it is about orbits. And this requires much more explanations. So, what does it mean to be orbit finite, and why is this the same thing? Mm. So let me, well, let's start with just the basic idea. So I want to explain what does it mean to be orbit finite. Well, clearly it's meant to say something like finitely many orbits, yes? But what does that mean exactly? And to show that, let's consider an example. Uh, 
the atoms are the rational numbers. And let's consider the set X, its pairs of rational numbers, such that, say, X equals Y, or X greater than 2. Okay? So here's a picture. This is all rational, all pairs of rational numbers. Plus infinity, minus infinity. So this set is what? It's... How many orbits with respect to atom automorphism does this set have? So remember an atom automorphism is a is a monotone function, well, order preserving function of the rational numbers. So if you take and apply an order preserving function to the rational numbers to something on the diagonal, you will end up again on the diagonal because it's x, x comma x will go to y comma y. But it will preserve order. So for example, if I have here, say, uh, uh, 1 comma 2, uh, and I shift it to apply an, uh, an order preserving function, it would maybe would be 5,8, but it's still going to be under the diagonal. So it has how many orbits? This set. Whoop. Sorry? Three. As represented by 1,1 1, 1 and 2,1. Okay. But let me not spoil the picture. So our set looks like this. So everybody here, assuming that this is 2, and then the diagonal as well. So now there's several natural ways in which you could say that this set uh, is orbit finite. The first one is x is contained in the uh, orbits well all possible orbits with respect to all atom automorphisms. Yeah. You take any element of our set X, you shift it around, you, you can shift it uh, by an atom automorphism to be either this, this, or this. Okay? And it's, uh, you cannot go smaller because it intersects this big, the, the upper, the lower, the, the, the upper, the lower, and the deck. Okay? But it's contained in, but it's not equal to. So, you could say it's equal to to the orbits of, and some with respect to atom automorphisms, which Fix two. So now I'm not allowed to use all atom automorphisms. I'm only allowed to use those with fix two. So there's fewer of them. So there's fewer automorphisms. The orbits become smaller because it's harder to, to, to move around. Okay. And now it's going to be what? It's going to be the examples are going to be one comma one, two comma two. How many? What is the orbit size of this with respect to such? atom automorphisms. How many other elements are in the orbit of this? Nobody. It's a, it's a trivial orbit. The diagonal falls apart into, it used to be one orbit, now it's three orbits, yes? And now the other part is uh, 2, 1, and uh, well, 2, 2 is already there, and 2, 3. 
Okay? So the, I, I hope that these are all examples with respect to such thing. I, I, maybe I forgot one, but I, I, I hope not. Okay? So as I increase, this is called the support. So here it was empty support. As a, so the support of an automorphism is those atoms which it doesn't touch. As I increase the support, there's fewer automorphisms and the orbits get smaller. Yes? So you could say that there's two natural definitions for orbit finiteness. One is you are contained in finitely many orbits and then it's in your best interest. And let me just write them out because I will. There's two notions that you could consider. First notion is X is what about uh, three and one? Is it three comma one? Yeah. yeah. I should have, I classified them, uh, yeah, I should have, so this is the diagonal and then there's three, one, three, two, and three, well, three, one, and three, two, uh, well, they're not the same, yeah? Oh, uh, there's more. <laughs> so if you think about it, what are the orbits? Let's draw the orbits, then you have to have the two. And the orbits are the zones, one, two, three, four, five, the two-dimensional orbits. Then there's seven, eight, the, the one-dimensional ones. And then there's the zero-dimensional one. Thank you, 11 and a half. And probably I forgot something, yeah? So now, well, you have to figure out which ones are, are in, okay? But I mean, the picture is clear, that, so yes? There are some elements of X belong. Yes, so now I, I, I do the orbit of all of Q squared. Ah, okay. And then some of them, some of them are in X and some of them are not. But because X is supported by two, it means that either the entire orbit is in X or it's disjoint. So X is, by virtue of being defined in terms of two, it's going to be a finite, well, it's going to be a union, it will turn out finite, but uh, it's going to be a union of some of these orbits. Now, there's two notions one could consider for a set X. These are orbits. Well, the biggest orbits are the epsilon means the empty tuple, yes? So I could just call them or orbits without saying. These are the biggest orbits. So if I want this to be fine, x to be contained in finitely many orbits, it's in my best interest to use uh, uh, the orbits with respect to the empty support, yes? Or, So let me put this like this. I say for every, cho for, sorry, for some choice, for some choice of support, the best choice is going to be empty support. But let me write it like this. For some choice of support, X is contained in finitely many orbits. Okay, that's condition one. And condition two is the same, but well, The same thing. Now the, it's a little bit sloppy notation because it should say, well, for every a, a there exists a, a, such orbits such that it's contained. Yes. So these are two natural notions of orbit finiteness. 
and maybe this one is the most natural one, but this one is, I think, quite natural as well. But the theorem is that they're equivalent. If the atoms are oligomorphic. And you could imagine several other notions of having finitely many orbits, and they would also be all equivalent. So under the assumptions that the atoms are oligomorphic, any meaningful notion of having finitely many orbits is going to be the same one, although the number of orbits will be different. And therefore, we can just, after proving this theorem, we can then use the definition. Any set which satisfies this is called orbit finite. Let me remind you what oligomorphic means. This means that the atoms have finitely many orbits. And in the definition of oligomorphism, it's uh, orbits with, like all po with respect to all possible automorphisms, so with empty support. But this is also true for a squared and a third and so on. So that was what oligomorphic meant. So what this theorem says is that sort of uh, if, the, if having finitely many orbits with, uh, I will call these equivariant orbits. It's a name that I will sometimes use. This is the same thing as an epsilon orbit, which means it's an orbit with respect to all automorphisms. And then on the other hand, we can talk about the, so it's a special case of A orbit for the empty tuple A, okay? So the biggest orbits are the equivariant orbits, but then as you increase the support, they get smaller. This theorem says that there might, they get smaller, but there's still finitely many of them, okay? And this is under the assumption of oligomorphism. So let's prove this. It's not very hard. Okay, well, clearly, we need to prove the top-down implication, yes? The bottom-up is immediate. So let's prove the theorem. Fuck you. Well, fuck me, actually. Uh, so let's start with subsets... Uh, uh, for which x's? I should say, uh, for which x's are we allowed to say this? I'm going to say x here for x's that are hereditarily finitely supported. Okay, just, just forgot about it. So let's prove this. So let's start with an X special case where X is just some tuples of atoms. In general, this could be a set of sets of sets of sets, but let's start with a special case. And this is a very straightforward result, which says that for every N K, And every A and A K has So this is this picture here. We took, in this particular case, we took k equals 2, so pairs of atoms. And then we tried it uh, first for empty support, and there were three orbits. And then we tried it for support equal to 2, and I think we had 13 orbits. 13 signs kind of suspicious, so I think we missed one or two. It probably should be like 12, look like 
be divisible by something or what. But uh, then if we took uh, like uh, a support of size three, that would mean that we would distinguish three atoms here. And then there would be like a whole lot of places in the grid. I don't know, there would be 127 orbits. So the number of orbits grows, but this lemma says that it's always finite. Um, it's clear in this particular example, but let me prove it uh, in the general case. It's very easy of lemma. So what does it mean that two tuples are in the same a orbit. It means you can go from one to the other by applying an automorphism and yet doing nothing to the underlying tuple A. Yes? So this is the same thing. Maybe let me just uh, A orbit of A n. It's the same thing as if I extended these two tuples by A So they're now in a bigger place. Are in the same equivariant. Yeah, it means the same thing. And that proves the lemma. Because there's finitely many orbits of this by our assumption of oligomorphism. Okay? So, there's so we know that the lemma. Ah, so maybe let me. Uh, okay, now let me use it to prove that uh, for, for this. So imagine this is a subset of A to the K. And suppose, and x is our subset. And suppose that it has finitely many A orbits. So now this is the partition of Well, there, I mean, there's nothing to do, yes? There's just finitely many orbits in, all together, so it can, it's contained in finitely many. This picture is meaningless. So no matter how many uh, atoms you have, it's, there's going to be finitely many little boxes anyway, so you can only be contained finitely. So that was for uh, tuples of atoms. But in general, we have to deal with sets which are not tuples of atoms. They're like sets of tuples of sets of tuples of sets of sets of atoms. Yeah. But the generalization is quite straightforward. Let's do it here. And somewhere we need to use this assumption. Oh, it's kind of stuck in my thought. Okay, so now take some x which satisfies the first condition, which satisfies the existential condition. Okay, which means that. Well, it's contained. Finitely many orbits. Okay. Uh, maybe let me draw it like a picture. So it's contained in finite, these are A orbits, the existential ones, yes? Or maybe even, as we remarked, the, these are equivariant orbits. Okay? Because the, the biggest orbits are the equivariant orbits. So I take any set X, which is hereditarily finitely supported, I will use this at some point, okay? 
and uh, I want to show that it's contained in finite meaning. Okay. So what do I do? I take some x here. There's finitely many choices if up to the big orbit. There's finitely many choices of x. Okay. And let the set is uh, supported by something. This is by the assumption it's finitely supported. So what does that mean? That means, just let me remind you, that uh, Well, just by definition, but if we restate it, it means the same thing as that if I take an element of x and I shift it around with something that respects a, then nothing's going to happen. And that means the same thing as x is a union of a orbits. So being supported by something is nothing, is just the same thing as being a union of orbits. Okay? This is what's just I'm not sure it's going to be useful in the pr pr uh, in the proof, but it's it's useful to know that supports are also. Okay, so now let's do it. So, I take some element, like him, and since the set is hereditarily finitely supported, so I already fixed the support of this whole set, but its elements also have finite support, yes? So, let B, this is a tuple of atoms, be a finite support of the element. Okay? And now, consider the following thing. I take B and I say I want to map it to X. I'm going to define a function now. Okay? But, there's if I take some pi, which takes me a similar element to B, I want to map it to a similar element X. So this is a, f I define a function F this way. So let me be a, li a little bit precise. So I define F to be the set of pairs pi of x, uh, pi of b, pi of x, ranging over pi, which is an A automorph. Okay? So it, for the moment, it's a binary relation. Yes? It just says, I start off with the pair bx, that's good, and then I can shift it by an A automorphism, and that's also good. So for the moment it's a binary relation, but it's kind of easy to see that it's also a, a function. And why is that? This is by definition of support. So imagine that I shift b by some other sigma, different and I get some other value, 
could it be that I get a collision? That, that would mean that's a violation of being a function, yes? Sorry? Thank you. Uh, correct. I apologize. So could it be that I can have some sigma which moves <laughs> the, the argument to the same place, but moves the, the, the input moves to the same place, but the output moves to a different place? That, that would be a violation of being a function. Could this happen? This is literally what support says, yes? It says that if pi and sigma agree on B, uh, on the support B, then they must, if they pi and sigma agree on this, then they agree on this. So that's just literally what support says. So this is going to be actually a function. Okay? It's a function from what to what? What is the domain of the function? The domain is the A orbit of B. Because as a possible input, you can get anything of the form pi of B with some A automorphism. What's a codomain? Sorry, I should have done something different. Should have done it simpler. So ignore this A. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Ignore this A here. I, I do take this B, but I take the full orbit of B. So A is the empty tuple here. So I take equivariant of B, and likewise here, the equivariant and here there's no restriction on pi. Okay? So what I have done here is I've defined a function from this uh, set to, well, something. Okay? Now, what is this set? It's contained in, well, if this tuple was of dimension n, then this is contained in a n. Yes? Okay? So, I could do this mm. So, this function here, if maybe on the picture would be easier to write it like this. Where did it go? This thing here, maybe let me use a color, is the same as this thing here. Yeah? It was a, the equivariant orbit. It was an equivariant orbit, and there's a unique equivariant orbit. So what I had here was I had a function, well, from some subset of A to the N. So this, we can do this. This is A to the N. And maybe there was a subset. Because it was the orbit of P. This is what we just had, yes? That was the function. Now, I want to prove this item. Okay? So now here comes some support A. Okay? I want to show that this set intersects finitely many A orbits. But what I can do is, according to what I proved pre theory, I can slash this.
according to A orbits. These are the A orbits of A of M. Yes? Okay? I claim that an orbit here, and there's finitely many of them by that lemma. Okay? I claim that an orbit here will be mapped to an entire orbit here. So let me put this as a lemma. F maps A orbits to A orbits. And it's just just by looking at the definition of F, it's kind of easy to see. So that means that if I had 27 orbits here, and you know, 17 of them intersected this set, then I will have at most 17 orbits here. Okay? So I have at most 27 orbits here, at most 27 orbits here, and at most 100 orbits here, so altogether finitely many orbits. So just because the result was true for tuples of atoms, it transfers to anything that can be obtained from tuples of atoms via such functions f as, as, as here, and you can construct such a function f by this assumption. Okay? So this proves a theorem uh, that orbit finiteness is a uh, well, well-defined notion. Okay? And uh, we will spend some time with that, but, well, maybe in the exercise session, but let me continue, I'll, I think I have 15 more minutes. So the only thing we've done so far, let me summarize, is that, that under the assumption of an oligomorphic structure, there's a meaningful notion of orbit finiteness. Okay? I just, so I just gave a definition and justified that it's well formed. And now, let me continue with this theorem. Okay? We have already proved that every set builder expression has finite support. These are just the things that appear in the set builder expression. So let me at least today finish the top-down implication. So we're left with showing that And this is kind of boring, it's, uh, so I'll just do it by example, okay? So let's take, do we still have any set builder expression? No. So the one that we had. So let's maybe start with this sub-expression. Beta. So it's a parameterized expression because it depends on an atom, yes? Mm. Uh, now what you can think of, a, of beta is that it's a function from atoms two sets. Yes? I want to, uh, and now our whole thing here, our whole set X, is obtained as follows, that we take all possible atoms, Some of them satisfy this constraint. So 
these are some which are good. And then we apply beta, we take the image. of those which are good. It just... Now, we can prove by induction that for every choice of y, this produces an orbit finite set. So now we want to show that the whole top level set is orbit finite. Well, what we just have to show is that, well, this function is somehow continuous, so it's very well behaved. And it has the property that it maps orbits to orbits. Now, in general, what you could have here, you could, might have some seven tuples of atoms. So the domain would be a to the seven. And it's a well-behaved function which maps orbits to orbits. And this set has finitely many orbits because eight, it's a to the seven. So the image will also have finitely many orbits. That's the general idea. It's nothing really truly interesting. So you can show that every set builder expression is hereditarily orbit finite. Okay? This gives you the bottom-up uh, implication. The top-down implication is much more interesting and before uh, I will not have time to prove it but I try to explain what goes on. So the top-down imp uh, implication says that if you take anything that's built out of atoms, which has hereditarily finite support and hereditarily orbit finite, then necessarily there's a corresponding set builder expression. Why is that not obvious? So let's take suppose I take not any set of sets of sets of sets, but just a set of tuples, okay? And the set is supported by A, which means that, you know, X in X, this is a, well, it's a tuple, yes? If and only if. So you take a uh, property of tuples, so an, a seven area relation, which is semantically invariant, which means that if the seven area relation holds for something, then it also holds for anything which is similar up to automorphism that preserve this. Okay? Is, well, is this hereditarily finitely supported? Does, I mean, does it satisfy the assumptions of the uh, of this? Well, yes, on the top level it's finitely supported, I just said this. Once you go inside, there's not, no, no place else to go because once you go hereditarily, there's nothing to do because an element of this is just a tuple and every tuple is finitely supported by the things that appear in it. So, a set of tuples is hereditarily finitely supported if and only if it's just finitely supported because its elements are just automatically finitely supported. Nothing hereditary to do. Uh, so it's hereditarily finitely supported. Is it hereditarily orbit finite? Well, yes. Any set of tuples is going to be of fixed dimension is going to be hereditarily orbit finite by this theorem, yes, by, by the assumption on oligomorphism, because a to the seven has finitely many equi equivariant orbits by definition of oligomorphism, so it satisfies the first condition, and also the second condition. But that's so that's so any finitely supported set of tuples is going to satisfy these two conditions, and therefore. If this theorem is true, which it is, it implies that you take any relation of RT7 on the atoms, and if that relation is invariant under automorphisms, with sufficiently large but finite support, then it is necessarily definable in first order logic.
well, okay, let me just write it more slowly, can be represented by a set builder expression. But if you unfold the definitions of what does it mean to be represented by a set builder expression, and in the special case of a set of tuples, I mean, it's a little bit of syntactic symbol pushing, uh, but that is just the same as, uh, as, as is, is defined, can be defined by a first order formula phi which has seven variables. I mean, this equivalence, it's, I mean, the bottom-up implication is immediate, the top-down implication, well, you have to unfold the definitions and think about it, it's not a big deal. So what you have is the theorem implies this. Any relation which has the semantic property of being invariant under automorphism is necessarily definable in first order logic. And that's not obvious at all. Okay. And I, wait a minute, is this? So for the last thing that I'd like to do is, so on the next lecture I will prove this theorem, okay? The, the, the remaining application. But let me finish by justifying this. And it's actually quite simple. So, suppose you have a graph. This is the vertices. Okay? And the, suppose that it is supported by A. So what it means is I apply this result. My assumption was that the graph is representable by a set builder expression, but by the theorem that means, and actually by the part of the theorem that we have already proved, by the bottom-up implication, it means that the set of vertices is hereditarily orbit finite and it has finite support. So it has some support. Okay? So let me partition the vertices according to the A orbits. This is N. A orbit. Okay? And I want to show that it has finite diameter. Okay? What I will show is, suppose that we choose some orbit as our starting vertex, uh, our st some starting orbit. Now imagine that from this orbit I can reach some place here. So from some vertex here, I can reach some vertex here. Okay? Then, if I take now a copy, so somebody else here, by definition of being in the same orbit, I can go from here to here by an automorphism. So if I apply that same automorphism that takes this guy to this guy, to the vertex V, then I get some other copy of V. By the assumption that this supports not only the vertices, but also the edges, it follows that if there was a blue edge here, then there's also a yellow edge here. So what this means is that if I start in this orbit, then in one step I will reach either none of all of these. Okay? So that means if this is my set of source vertices, then at each step of the reachability algorithm, I'm going to add either an entire orbit or nothing. And that means that, you know, if I choose my set of vertices, then if I can reach a vertex from it, then I can reach it in at most number of orbit steps. So that's the argument. It doesn't literally prove that theorem. What I should have done is I wanted, well, I should start, I, I said I start from a set of vertices. What I should do is be a little bit more careful, but it's the same argument. 
I want to prove that it has finite diameter. So I start with some little vertex. And I choose A so that it supports both of the graph and the vertex V. Because it's hereditarily finitely supported, so there's, everybody has a finite support, also the elements. So I take my little vertex V, what is the, and I partition the whole thing into A orbits. Now, because V is supported by A, it means its orbit has only V, because I cannot go from V to anybody else by applying an A automorphism, that's the definition of being supported. So, if I do it now, then I say that if I can reach anybody from little v, then I can reach it in a bounded number of steps, namely the number of orbits. So this proves the sphere. Okay? Uh, so now we know by this theorem, and by the part that we have already, already proved, so we have proved this theorem because it falls on from the bottom-up implication, we know that if we choose our atoms to be oligomorphic, then the very straightforward graph reachability algorithm which just starts with the source vertex and then just mm, computes the reachable vertices will always terminate in finite time. Mm, that's very nice. So, uh, I think this is where I like to end today. Thank you. We were discussing, uh, I mean, oligomorphic structures. Uh, and we said that, you know, set builder expressions and stuff like that has good consequences for oligomorphic structures. But maybe it would be good to have some examples. So let's do that. And uh, let's just restrict to structures, also known as graphs where there is the, there's the universe, which I will call V because it's a graph, and then there's one binary relation. And then uh, even undirected graphs would be fine. Okay? So symmetric. And without self -ups. So, you know, let's ask, so given a graph, we can ask, is it oligomorphic? Okay? So give me an example of an oligomorphic graph. Are you proud of yourself? <laughs> so an example which is just slightly less stupid than that one is, for example, this one. Because it's a finite graph and that's why it's stupid. Okay? Because if we have vertices u, v, w, then we are going to be discussing, for example, A7 is what? It consists of tuples like in U, V, V, U. Well, and there's going to be finitely many tuples altogether. So, there's going to be finitely many up to automorphism. Okay? But maybe it's good to... Uh, so, every finite structure is going to be trivially oligomorphic. Okay? So, in this sense, oligomorphic means it's a, it's a kind of finite. By the way, what does, what does the word mean? You can, it's like oligarchy. So what's oligarchy? What's monarchy? Monarchy is there's one ruler, mono, yes? Oligarchy means there's not a lot of ru rulers. There's few rulers, and that's what oligomorphic means. It means there are not so many shapes. Okay, that's, that's the, the word. But let's stay with this example. What are the automorphisms of this graph? of the structure, which means automorphism of this graph. Yeah. So maybe let's take another one slightly bigger.
Sigma ABCD is nicer. What are the automorphisms of this structure? Or this is the same thing as graph automorphisms in this case? Sorry? Okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> You can rotate it and you can take mirrors, okay? Now, what does it mean, uh, so it's clear what are the automorph, when I'm talking about A up to automorphism, so how many orbits does A have? One. Because you can, but how many orbits does A2 have? So I want to take some pair like x, y, and some other pair like, I don't know, x prime, y prime. And I want to know if I can map x, y to x prime, y by an automorphism. Now I want to underline that when we're talking about mapping x, y to x prime, y prime, it is the same automorphism that map that's used for x and for y. Yes? I don't independently choose an automorphism here and an automorphism here. It's the same automorphism that's applied. Yes? Otherwise, there would be one orbit because I would independently choose one here and independently choose one here. But they're dependent, yes? So how many orbits does A2 have? Sorry? Yeah. Equal... Uh, Neighbors and non-neighbors. Yeah? So somehow the notions that exist in the structure are, well, at least the binary concepts that are possible are being equal, are being a neighbor, and being a non-neighbor. Other things are non-concepts. Okay? And then, okay, I don't know, for a to the power of 3, I don't know what happens. Okay. So every finite graph is oligomorphic. <coughs> Let's give an infinite graph. No Sorry? No okay, well, you know what I'm, I, what insults you deserve, but of course we have to start with that, yeah? So here an automorphism is any permutation, so uh, how many orbits, what are the orbits of A? There's one orbit, the orbits of two is just equal or not equal, so there's two, the orbits of n. What do you need to know about an n-tuple of vertices in order to determine its orbit? Sorry? Which ones are equal to each other? So this is essentially the structure of equality only that we've been dealing with. I mean, we can call it a graph with an empty set of edges, but it's, uh, it's not really, there's no edges really. Okay? By the way, how many orbits? There's a name. I mean, it's like this dihedral group, you just have to know the name. It's, <laughs> it's called the Bell number. Because, uh, I think, <laughs> uh, because an equality type is just a partition of it, yes? To say which coordinates from 1 to n are equal to each other and which ones are not equal to each other. So it's just a partition. And from what I remember, the number of partitions of an n element set is the Bell number. It's not very important. To okay. Another graph. Give me another graph which is oligomorphic. You're allowed to give stupid examples. So, Sorry? Full graph. Full graph. Well. Yeah? So you flip the edges in a graph, it, that doesn't affect oligomorphism. So it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's not oriented in that sense. It's the same thing. Okay. Let's continue. 
Another graph. So what if we take like uh, pairs of natural numbers? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's hope it doesn't look like a... Let's start with the grid, okay? That's a graph. Oligomorphic or not? On an infinity in both directions or only one? Sorry? Infinity in both directions or only one? Let's say it's infinite in both directions. Okay, let's let's do all cases because I think well this is an exercise session, so it's kind of convenient. So, first of all, let's suppose it, it's 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 infinite uh, in uh, it's a quarter plane. Okay, so there's an upper there's this corner. Okay. Well, what are the automorphisms of this? I think you can take a symmetry. I think there's one out. Well, there's two out. There's you can. F there's this one diagonal symmetry, and I think that's it. Okay. So well, if there's two automorphisms, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Uh, but if we uh, so here every uh, the the only uh, the, the orbits are going to be just pairs, like antipodal pairs with respect to the diagonal. So let's make this a little bit. It's, it's, it's infinite in all directions, so that at least you can shift it around and maybe even take this flip. So now what? Well, it, it, uh, previously it was also not oligomorphic. <laughs> uh, so now it's why it's not oligomorphic? How many orbits in A? One. How many orbits in a squared? Sorry? Infinitely many, because for example, if I take a pair like this, xy, and I apply an automorphism to it, what's an, what's an example of an invariant that's preserved? Distance. Distance. Okay? So, and since there's infinitely many possible distances, then, uh, uh, then there, you, you cannot be oligomorphic, which actually proves that theorem. Well, sort of. So let's put it this way. Let's, it, it does prove it, but it has a little bit more argument, but, so, but let's do it straight away. Imagine that a graph is oligomorphic. So it's true that this theorem says, well, if you remember, the proof was for any oligomorphic atoms, actually. But this proof said, well, the graph is not necessarily the atoms themselves, but it's something constructed out of the atoms. But what one can show is that if, you, if the atoms are oligomorphic, and then you construct an, a graph on top of these atoms using a set builder expression, then that graph itself is going to be oligomorphic. That you can show. But, uh, uh, so, uh, but let's assume that, and suppose that the graph is oligomorphic. What is its diameter? And it's connected. It has to be finite, yeah? Because suppose that you have an oligomorphic graph and then it has infinite diameter. So that means that there's a pair of vertices at distance 1, there's another pair of vertices at distance 2, there's another pair of vertices at distance 3, and so on. The distance is an invariant of orbits, so if you have x, y at distance 7, then anything in the orbit of that, if you map x, y by an automorphism, it will still have distance 7. So by oligomorphism, you cannot have infinitely many possible distances. So that, that explains this uh, finite diameter thing. So these graphs have to be highly connected somehow. Okay, okay but let's continue with oligomorphic graphs. Give me another oligomorphic graph. So let's take as an example two clicks. Okay. 
two disjoint clicks. Uh, how many orbits in A1? Well, maybe what are the automorphisms of this graph? You can swap or not, and then you can permute in itself. Yes, so it's is a group that's generated by the swap. Well, a swap. <laughs> I mean, the su suggests that there's some canonical bijection, and then uh, by permutations of, say, the, the left side. Okay, so you can. So how many orbits in A one? How many orbits in A2? Yes, so you can have, well, the equal orbit. So if this is x, y, z, then the orbits are xx. X, X, Z, and X, Y. Yes? So there's a concept of... Uh, there's a concept of equality, of being in the same group but not being equal, and then being in different groups. Okay? So there's three. Okay, and then more. Okay? Mm. Generally speaking, if you have two graphs, and this is what Grasik said, and they're oligomorphic, both of them, and you take their disjoint union, then it's also going to be oligomorphic. Why? So let's, let's, let's prove that we have finitely many types of, K of four tuples, okay? Let's consider A to the four, okay? So we have to show that up to automorphisms of this structure, there are uh, finitely many four tuples. So I have one four tuple and another one. Now what? What should I do? I mean, maybe the other one is maybe focus. What information should I store about this four tuple to, un to uniquely identify its, its type up to automorphisms? From which graph? So say this guy is from graph one, 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 and this guy is from graph two. Okay. So there's exponentially many ways this can happen, but if the dimension is fixed, then there's a finite number of ways. And once you have fixed the dimension and fixed the way this happens, then if you take some other guy that has the same type, then by induction assumption, if you just focus on the ones, there's finitely many ways in which this can, in which this can be done. Yes. In other words, the, the, the underlying part here is that every automorphism here, every, if you take out an automorphism of this and an automorphism of this, then the, the, the pair is an automorphism. You could have others because, for example, maybe you can swap it or something. There could be additional ones, but at the very least, you're going to have these aut automorphisms by one, by two, and these are enough to have finitely many orbits. Okay. What about, yeah, give me another graph. That's oligomorphic. Surrounded. Yeah, is it time? We'll discuss the random graph, I think, next time.
there is a ladder. So the word ladder can be understood in several different ways. So uh, this is one. You're not going to go very high on this ladder. It's going to, it falls apart. So uh, another one is this. It's not wider, yeah? So, which one is oligomorphic? Sorry? Why is the right one not oligomorphic? Yeah, it has infinite diameter. Okay, so that rules it out straight away. What about this one? What's an automorphism of this graph? You can, yeah, uh, as Victor said, you can swap around the, 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 the rungs of the ladder and then you can you just flip them around, okay? So, how many, how many orbits in A squared? Three, so you could be equal. You could be like this, or you could be like this. Okay. Another one. So there's another type of the ladder, this chromodity of the ladder. But that one is a, is a, is a common generalization of this type of ladder with a simpler graph. Namely, yeah, so give me another graph which is, uh, the vertices are like this. Uh, this is going to be a directed graph. Okay, give me an, uh, now, now it's a, uh, I want a directed graph, which is kind of dense, but it's not the clique. So clique directed from the vertex of lower low numbers. Edges go to the right, yes? I mean, there's. Oh, oh. Okay. Oligomorphic or not? Sorry? Why not? Yes. Well, first of all, Actually, you should have said, the question is ill-posed. Because this does not uniquely specify the graph just by saying that the edges go to the, in that direction. You could do it in several different ways. The one that you mentioned, Victor, is that it's the integers, yes? And this is what the picture suggests. So that the vertices are integers, yes? 0, minus 1, minus 2, and so on, 1, 2, and so on. And then you have edges from an integer to any bigger integer. That's the way that what the picture suggests. Is this, now this is a well-defined graph. Is it oligomorphic? What are the automorphisms? Shifts. Translations, shifts, I mean, yeah? So this, we know that it's not oligomorphic because uh, well, it has finite diameter, something like two, or one. <laughs> uh, but uh, if, if you take like these atomic paths, uh, then uh, and, uh, with respect to longest such, path. sorry, longest path distance. Thank you, longest path distance. Then that all sorts of notions, like every notion is going to be a, a every reasonable graph notion is going to be. A, invariant on the graph automorphism, that's what a graph notion is. So if you take longest path distance, then you, you can have only finitely many values for that. And uh, here you don't. Okay? 
But I could have chosen the vertices in a different way. If I take the natural numbers, this doesn't help. It's the same problem. It's even worse because there's no automorphisms. Yes. But there's another choice of doing it, which works. Which is what? I mean, the picture is meant to be completely unclear, so that it doesn't help you. You take the rational numbers, OK? And this structure is the same thing as Q with this relation. And then we have discussed that here uh, you can uh, the, this this is oligomorphic. So why? Because the automorphisms are just order-preserving functions. So if I take any triple, then I can map it to any other triple. But I needed to have the rational numbers. I need to be able to insert things. So the rational numbers are, are oligomorphic, and you can view the rational numbers as a special case of a graph. This is a directed graph, but there's an easy, there are easy ways to model directed graphs as undirected graphs. So that's uh, it's, uh, it's not, not a big deal. Okay. So I hope you got some feeling about oligom. Maybe let me give you. Uh, a few more examples. And then we'll try to... Mm -hmm. So, uh, the independent set, which is also known as the natural numbers of equality, we had Beautiful picture. The rational numbers of order, but we have this, say, for example, we have this ladder. Now, uh, the picture, well, necessarily anything I draw on the whiteboard, on the blackboard, will have some kind of order, but it's important that it doesn't have an order, yes? Another example, maybe kind of nice, would be this. It's we'll use that at some point. Okay? So this is uh, the lowest thing is just, uh, yeah. But they all have the same length, yes? Uh, what if I took a cycle of length 1 plus a cycle of length 2 plus a cycle of length 3 and so on? Would that be oligomorphic? No, because of the diameter argument, for example. Yes? Not really, no. It said that if you take any two vertices which have finite diameter, the, 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 the property of a pair, the diameter function, Well, plus it's, yeah, plus infinity. This function is invariant under automorphisms. Therefore, if I feed it with two, with, with one pair for, and, and I feed it with another pair from the same orbit, it's going to give me the same values. And therefore, if this has finitely many orbits, then the diameter function has finitely many possible values. So this excludes these uh, bigger and bigger cycles. Okay. So now, let's revisit uh, these, def these uh, for, let's, let's discuss first order definability. So let me consider the following situation.
Let me consider binary relations on the vertices which are definable in first order logic. Okay? So give me an example of a binary relation that's definable in first order logic, uh, say, in this graph. Yeah. Smaller, yes? Bigger, equal. And that's. Or bigger than five, if I'm allowed to use parameters. Yes? Now, the question is this. For which of these definable relations might admit a choice, which is, so let's consider relations such that for every input there is at least one output, okay? And so you have a first order definable binary relation on vertices, and you might want to ask, when can you it's called uniformization or finding a choice. When can you take a function also definable in first order logic, which inputs V and outputs W? So the, my question is this, is this true for all R? Is this always true? Depending on the thing. So let's try here. Can you find, in this graph, if anybody gives you a first order definable binary relation, can you always find a function which, which uh, uh, implements it? Which, so what's an example? The full relation is uniformized by the identity relation. Okay, so let's start with one. So let me just be clear. Let me try to uh, underline what goes on here. Do we use constants or not? And we're allowed to use constants. Okay? So the question is for which graphs from this list is this true? For all R. So, is it true that for every FO definable binary relation I can find a choice function which implements it? Okay, so let's start with this one. True or false? So, just to be sure that at least so far we don't have an example, because if we took R of x, y, if and only if true, so everybody, then an example of the function is just x maps to x. This is clearly first order defined, yes? So, sorry? So let's try another one. This one looks kind of bad. Because how can you input x and produce somebody different? Constant. Use constants. So how do you uniformize it? If x equals 1, then, then 2. Uh, so this one worked out. There is a choice function. Okay. 
So maybe it's worthwhile trying to think what is the general form of a first order definable relation here. Because the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, and if you remember, we had this theorem, I think it got erased at some point, but it's, it follows from this, that a binary relation is definable in first order logic if and only if it is invariant under automorphisms for some well-chosen support. So let's use this. So this means the same thing as invariant under A automorphism for some A. I mean, for some A, it's invariant under all A automorphisms. Okay, and this is a maybe useful description. So suppose that my constants, that are the, the, the constants used in the formula are, say, 1, 2, 3. How can this binary relation work? How can a binary relation here that uses one, two, three as constants? What, what kind of binary relations with one, two, three as constants can you have? So basically, if you get an input, well, if it's one, then there's some special value. If it's two, then it's some special value. If it's three, there's some special value. By the way, that special value needs to be necessarily one, two, or three. And then if you get a generic value like eight, then the possible outputs, well, uh, it's, it's, it's either all generic values or no generic values, or just eight, uh, exactly eight, yes? So for an input, which is generic, meaning not one, two, three, then the outputs can be only uh, compared with equality with respect to the input. Yes? So you just have to ask what is the... For such a relation, you only need to ask You know, if it's supported by one, two, three, then you want to ask what is related to eight. Well, four would be also good, yeah? And then we know that maybe there's one, two, three here, maybe there's one, maybe there's three, there's not two, there's three. And then there's maybe eight or not eight, this we don't know. But all the others, they're either all in or all out. Okay, so there's like finitely many cases to consider. So let's suppose that the relation says that uh, 8 gets mapped to 1, not 2, uh, not 3, not 8, well, to 3, yes, but to all the others, no. Uh, and here, uh, to all the others, yes. So suppose this is the relation. How do we uniformize it using a func how do we find a choice function? Well, you map everybody to one, yeah? yeah. And if this was disallowed, then you would need to map everybody to either four or five using the same trick. So if you think a bit about it longer, then indeed the answer here is Yes, for the first structure. So the crucial is that we have finite in many possibilities. Yeah, but uh, let's let's do the next exercise, the next item, and it will mm, it will also be consistent with the, script, the description that we have finitely many possibilities. But the answer will be no. Okay, so now let's consider the rational numbers. Give me a binary relation which cannot be uniformized.
uniformized means finding a choice function. It's a synonym. Smaller. Smaller. There is no function which inputs somebody and gives somebody that's strictly smaller. I mean, there's, that would require a proof, but you can sort of... There's no way of choosing a, a, a smaller number. Okay? So here the answer, in the second one, the answer is no. The third one. Can you do it or not? Sorry? That's a function already. <laughs> Out of the box. <laughs> We're talking about this. <laughs> It is. But it's a little bit subtle because the fourth one is not roughly the same as the first one. Okay? Because what's a relation that cannot be uniformized? Well, it's, sorry? The neighbor relation. Because there's two choices of a neighbor and you cannot do this, you know, uh, there's no way to do this in, in general. I mean, this would require a proof, but you can sort of visualize. So it can be a little bit subtle. Now, let's uh, continue. How much more time have we got? Okay, it's good. So what we have done right now so far is we have chosen the atoms themselves to be a graph. Okay? Now let's consider a different situation where we fix the atoms to be okay? And what I want to do is I want to create a graph out of these atoms by a set builder expression. Okay? Which, and uh, now it's up to isomorphism of graphs. So which of the above four graphs can I get by set builder expressions over this graph? The first one clearly, let me just write it. So just The second one is going to be, prob well, the second one, okay, no. This would require some proof, okay, but let's, uh, the second one, no. Third one, can we get it? Yes. The general idea is to take, let me write it first like this, and then explain what this means. So, two, we can view this as a set zero, one, because everything is a set here, yes? Zero, we can view as the empty set, and one, we can view as singleton of the empty set. Yes? And then there's other ways to do this, but let's, let's take this one. Okay? So what does this mean? The vertices are pairs of the form an atom and an identifier, which is either the empty set or the singleton of the empty set. This is just to illustrate that you can, use, you can have colors by, by you know, placing lots of brackets. Okay? So the expression is going to be mm -hmm. 
that's, that's just for the vertices, okay? And now this is not fully finished yet because one needs to remember that this round bracket is uh, code for something, you know, a little bit, uh, it's a bit longer. And what is E? It's just a set. Ah, uh, well, and the other way around, yes, because it's an undirected graph, okay? So you can achieve graph number three by a set builder expression. Can you do this with graph number four? Same idea, yeah? You take four copies of the atoms and then you, you connect them the right way. So I think maybe now is a good time to consider the following question. Consider the following decision problem. So you're given two graphs by set builder expressions. So possible things you could have is one, three, and four. But then there's other examples you can get. So what's a natural question to ask? It's an open problem. Okay, so this is a. Uh, uh, no, it's not clear. Uh, if you want to think about it, I encourage you. Uh, it seems to be hard. Uh, but let me. And I think we have a few more minutes to do this. Let me finish by discussing this problem a little bit. So first of all, what is the question? It asks... You can understand the question in at least one of two ways. Or three ways. There's, there's three ways to understand the question. One... Is there... Some, isom some function... Bijection, uh, which preserves edges. What well, maps edges to edges and non edges to non edges. That's the first way to understand it, and this is the way I understood it when I said it's an open problem. But there's other ways which could be, well, you might want to say that this function itself is, is an uh, allowable object. Yes? So you could say the same, but I is finitely supported. Well, I is uh, represented by a set of regression. So I will, I will give you an example of why item one and two are not the same item. Okay, and maybe the third one you might want to ask is uh, not only is it represented by a um, set builder expression, but without any parameters. So somehow it's like uh, you don't need to have any parameters without parameters, without constants. 
Okay? So let me give you examples why these are different questions. Is the first one that's open. Okay? Mm. And Shimon, second one, is it open? I, you told me that I don't remember. Uh, 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 definable isomorphism between two graphs. No, it's, uh, it's on the side. It's, okay, so this one's closed. <laughs> okay. So, to illustrate why these are not the same idea, not, not the same things, suppose that G, G, Uh, the first one has the vertices are the atoms and there's no edges. Okay? Second one is pairs of atoms and there's no edges. Are they isomorphic as graphs? In the sense, in the first sense? Well, clearly, yes, because it's just two countably infinite sets without any edges. Can you define a set builder expression which maps this to that? Well, that amounts to the question, is there a function that's a bijection which is defined by a set builder expression? Well, let me call it I, yes? And by the results that we had uh, during the, uh, the, the lecture, this means, is there like a finitely supported function from this to this? And you can sort of see that it's impossible, yes? How can you get, generate a pair out of a single element, yes? There's, there's no, no way to do this in a reasonable way without uh, avoiding collisions. Uh, but maybe the last thing I want to do is suppose now that we consider item 3 as a decision problem. Okay? I, th I think I'm out of time, yeah? So maybe... Uh, uh, I won't put, do this as homework because it's easy, easy to find the solution, but uh, just it's, 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 it's non-gradable non homework. Try to think about it, why it's decidable, and think about why it's decidable using a simple brute force algorithm. Okay? So, why it's, try to think about how, why it's easy to check all possible candidates for these isomorphisms. Okay? Right. So, okay, now we're done. And I guess I should give homework, yes? Um, well, there, sh there should be some way of passing the, the course. You can get this at the end of the entire course. So next week we have two more meetings. Uh, okay. Uh, but you, uh, so it's up to you. We can so uh, I think what I will do is I will uh, put it up on my website. No, not now, you guys want to go home, I guess. Uh, a few exercises, there will be two ways of, uh, of passing the course. The first way is going to be uh, uh, to solve some exercises, and then the second way is going to be find mistakes in my lecture notes. Okay? Uh, so, uh, on my website there you can find lecture notes, and I, I will, you can find this also in the link. And I will, there will be like a price, like I don't know, 20 mistakes, you pass the lecture or something. Okay? So the, the, that's, uh, that would be another way. And actually for me this is the one I want you to do. Uh, because, uh, uh, but if you don't like finding mistakes, then there will be some exercises you're allowed to choose. But if you want to do me a favor, please find the mistakes. What I would probably do is I will, uh, in order to avoid too much unhealthy competition, I will match you with chapters and, and then ask you to find uh, 
errors. Okay, then there will be some system that I would put up. Okay, if, and then I'll be grateful if you do that. Okay, so that's so. See you next. Yes. Uh, two grammatical errors. Yes. To be honest, even if you point out a mistake that's not really a mistake, I will still count it. But I will think badly about you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what I will do, I will just count the number of lines in your email and give you that many points. But then I will think something in, you know, in, my, in my soul. <laughs> That's, 